Okay, hello and good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us on this lovely sunny afternoon um, down here in Winchester, so I hope it's just as nice where you are. My name's uh, Becky, I'm a research manager here at Market Sciences Unlimited. Um, and for this next webinar, um, we're looking at um, 10 ways to UX test your website. Um, so this is going to be um, hosted by uh, my colleague Amy Nichols, who is a research director um, here and has been working in the market research industry for the past 12 years. Um, she's got lots of experience predominantly in the retail sector um, conducting research, but also in working with our sort of digital experts and our technology experts um, looking at web usability and kind of putting the voice of the consumer in there and, and design, helping to design websites um, with those things in mind. Um, so I will hand over to Amy. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, welcome to this webinar today, which is going to quickly run through 10 ways um, in which you can do usability testing on your website, but with a twist. So this is about using the principles of insight and market research, which we're probably all familiar with, um, to really create websites that are for the user and not for the developer. Um, long gone really are the days when simply being online or having a technically clever website is enough and it is absolutely up to brands regardless of what sector they're in to offer something of value and to engage with their customers in, in a unique way and usability testing should be used to ensure that your online content is optimized to deliver maximum engagement and impact that goes without saying but when you are UX testing one principle is really really critical um, and that is, and I truly believe, that putting the consumer at the heart of your UX and not the developer. So sorry if there are any developers out there listening. You guys are really important as well, but you also have to listen to, um, to your consumer and to your insight team. So this is, I mean, developers, they'll be looking for specific system blocks that need to be removed to ensure compliance of a system. But really, what is more important is understanding what consumers do in reality to achieve their given aim on a, on, a, on, a, on a site. True UX testing kind of highlights what customers do, what consumers do while they're on your site, why they do it, how it makes them feel, um, and also what they might do next as a result. So putting the consumer at the heart of your UX will ensure that your site is really, really well designed and really ultimately consumer friendly. So this webinar is a take on how we as researchers are working with brands at the moment to optimise things such as wording, content, site design, navigation and engagement um, through customer insight. So I hope you can all see this. Uh, we've all seen this in our near nearest park, haven't we? Basically design has put a barrier in to slow people down because they think that will work well. And what do people do? They take their own route. And that's certainly the case in my park. Um, I think, depending on what angle you're coming at this from as well, um, it's also really important to think about what the aim of your website is. So you might be e-commerce, um, you might be creating a website because you're building a brand or trying to communicate some messaging around that. Um, you might also be building a website to communicate a very specific product or message or, or a cause. Um, and I think you have to think about, are you trying to lead your your web browsers down a certain path. So do you want them to leave your site either with products in their shopping basket or maybe an enhanced view of your brand? One thing is really, really clear um, and certainly something that I think we will all have seen um, through browsing the internet over the years is that web design moves on so quickly. So today's web design trend is basically going to be tomorrow's outdated website. Um, and I think today's trend of having sort of key big full screen images and minimal impactful text, um, which is often seen in a lot of websites now, has a massive um, impact on overall communication. And that is often positive, but we have to consider what impact does it have on other functions within the website, so detailed communication or e-commerce and, and ultimately navigation. I think also another trend we're seeing with websites is using video on the home page um, as a key messaging tool. But again, this impacts on your site usability massively. Um, and whether or not this is a plus or a negative will depend on which point of view you, you, you have. So it's really important to remember, um, before we start, that website design, um, I call it a beautiful marriage between what developers can do technically um, and what users really, really want in order to achieve um, their aim on a site. Before we get into the 10 ways, um, 
a bit of suspense, so let's talk about beta testing. Um, before UX, um, remember basically UX is at all stages and it can be done at any point of a web design process, but I think the most powerful time um, to test your website is before you've launched it. So if you're doing a big redesign or a big change, getting that um, UX and that insight done before it's launched is obviously going to be a big potential money saver, time, time saver, because it allows you to make your tweaks and changes before your site goes live. And there may be internal time pressures to get your site out of beta, and I expect you'll have stakeholders left, right and centre wanting to launch it, wanting to get it live. Um, but we do believe the beta stages really mustn't be uh, rushed where possible um, until all problems and niggles have basically been ironed out. I think we've also all seen on websites when they've gone live and they still are in beta, um, beta, beta phase, if you like, um, and that I think I, th I see always think, think that's a positive because it sends a message to the user um, that the site is in development and so um, there may be perhaps a more slightly accepting view of errors and problems with the user experience as a result of that. Um, either way, beta testing is, is a massively important stage. Right, so if you're ready, um, we're going to go through 10 ways to do UX uh, on your website using Insight. So let's begin. So number one. Um, is click paths. So you will probably already be monitoring your click paths through your own analytics. Uh, Google certainly does a fantastic job of this. Or you'll have a team uh, beside you that were doing this. And this is great and it's really important and this is often the first place to start when trying to understand your own website. However, when usability breaks down, so when there's an issue on your site, uh, when things aren't performing as they should and you're trying to figure it out, people often disengage with their device or their laptop um, and they stop clicking. So that's when you become blind and you need to have a more powerful UX solution on hand at this point. Because your click paths, they don't also tell you what the user is thinking or what they need when they're actually clicking through your site. However, click paths is a really great way to identify whether the path that users are taking through your website is the path that you want them to take. And that's probably the first point of call for any um, web developer. Number two, so when you need to know more, research can really start to help. Um, and qualitative research um, is one of the best ways of exploring your current user experience. And we often do accompanied consumer safaris um, with users and potential users of your sites. So that's where you basically will sit with your web visitors and you will understand what their reaction is to your website as they navigate them, themselves through it. And sitting down with your user, we can ensure that all the key aims of the website are tested. So depending on what your objective is, we can set them tasks and, um, and watch them um, as they attempt to complete them. And I think it's really great because it reveals users' reactions to the website um, as they're using it. Um, and it really clearly demonstrates where there are stress points and frustrations. Um, and it is best done face-to-face, -face, um, and we always try to do it face-to-face, -face, um, but it can also be done remotely via shared screens, which um, is massively helpful if you have um, people based in diverse locations or potentially in different countries, and we find that works really well. And it can basically uncover things about how they're feeling about your website, which is not something you can get from a click path analysis. Um, and it's great to explore reactions to specific things on your website. So, I don't know, you might be wanting to know what people think of your sitemap because perhaps your developer has taught, told you that that's really important. But what do consumers really think? Um, and it's also, you know, really great for exploring things like attitudes towards search buttons and search, fun search functions, for example. Right, number three. Um, so we recommend eye tracking your visitors. So eye tracking technology, and I'll show you some examples, um, will record not only mouse and finger movements, but where people are actually looking on the screen. So we can uh, create things like heat maps from eye tracking, which will highlight where people look and will show where people don't look as well. So are you sure that, for example, that people are actually scrolling down your page and seeing items below the line? So how eye tracking works, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, um, but for web-based eye tracking, you'd basically recruit some target respondents to take part in a 
half an hour to an hour task based interview in front of the device and um, interviewers would kind of sit with them and involve it would involve a combination of discovery um, open use and then giving them tasks and then watching how they how they uh, interact with your site and usually both their screen session and a self image so a camera that looks back at the respondent and sees what they're what they're doing and what they're talking about can provide a really cool picture of um, you know for later analysis and it can show you how a user is really thinking which is fantastic for stakeholder um, engagement in any study this is a screenshot actually that I did from the Costa website so Costa Coffee really trendy and their website is very much about brand building um, and at the moment we're seeing a really big trend in web design where parallax uh, one page design you know those ones that you scroll down and down and down it's all the rage in the design world at the moment um, and our question is always well, can you be sure that it is always being seen um, actually this Costa website is a highly visual um, non-standard site design and it's massively unpredictable and it's probably you know it defies a lot of the known conventions in web design and I think what would be really interesting to do eye tracking on this and see heat maps to demonstrate which aspects are providing focal points um, and it will also tell cost of where there's dead space and can be better used and I think when you look at that it's not completely obvious where to click um, which is very different to other sites that we see. Also with eye tracking um, in this particular example this is an example of a heat map on the Argos website so we ask people to look at it and we can see that people tend to look at the top left and at key sale items. Um, there's a lot of price promotion on the as to web, um, Argos website. Um, however, you can see from this heat map that it looks like that maybe the journey is quite complicated. And maybe there's lots of different things to look at. If you also look at the John Lewis website, which we did a similar exercise on, you can see that that visit is much clearer and the eye is drawn to that navigation down the side of the page um, for both the sidebar and the keyword search box and this sort of thing can be so much better than just asking people because people tend to post rationalize and that's a problem we always have in research but when you're setting up an eye tracking study I think it's important to think about who the profile of your web users are um, and match that to who who we re are recruiting I mean effectively you're asking them to take part in an accompanied web browse um, um, using eye tracking technology as well Okay, um, on to the next one. Uh, in this example, actually, that we did for Consumer Council for Water, um, they're a government website, we can actually see that users are sticking to the information at the top, really sticking to the top of the page. Um, and it is actually well known in web design that below the line information can get totally lost on a page. Um, so eye tracking will show you how a menu is being used and when there's good interaction with that menu. Um, which is definitely the case in this particular example. In terms of uh, eye tracking, it can also provide you with gaze plots to show you routes around the page. And I'm just going to uh, click play on this as an example from uh, the Amazon website. So, I mean, eye tracking can show you the order that individuals look at items on your site and for how long. Um, in this example, we're getting the participant to search the Amazon website for an iPad. Uh, this particular participant is, um, is actually using the menu, um, is actually using the menu to search for, their I, um, for the iPad. And we can see uh, and we can talk to them about their frustrations live as they navigate through the site and it can uncover some really serious issues. And it can also be a really excellent convincing tool for stakeholders to justify any changes that they need to make to their, to their website. Um, at the end of a session, you can also review those gaze plots. So it doesn't have to all be about live video. You can look and you can show routes around your page. So here's an example from a different site. It's quite quanty, um, but you can, if you want, analyze the gaze plots and kind of uh, use that data um, in a more quantified way. My fifth tip <clears throat> is quite a short one really, but uh, it sounds obvious, but you must be device agnostic. So you've got to remember that people use your site on PC, mobile, tablet and, and, and devices. Are, all three of those are really important. Um, and I think it's just critical to remember, you know, what are the differences between peop how people use your site depending on what, what device they're on um, and how your mobile site is working. 
And I think um, UX is a great way to test that your site is not only rendering correctly in different devices, but that the user journey is exactly how you want it to be. The sixth tip is to step back. So I think this is partially being covered, but it's so important to allow people to discover your site for themselves. So in a research environment, leaving them alone, giving them no direction, and just watching what draws their eye, what interests them. Because that is how we as consumers, how we look at websites. We don't have somebody sat there saying, okay, now go and see if you can um, log on. So look at users and look at what they want to look at most on your website. And is that a surprise to you? Is that the thing you really want them to look at? Um, if not, then you need to reconsider your design or maybe your layout um, and certainly your call to actions and then retest. Number seven is task-based. So on one hand, it's all about watching them um, as they go about their their own journey through your website, but it is also really important to do task-based um, uh, interviews. So you'd have in your mind a certain route, no doubt, that you ideally would like people to take through your site, and I'm sure there will be loads of call to actions and really logical paths um, through your site um, based on careful hours of planning and consideration amongst your teams. However, are they really working? So UX is about setting people a set task and then leaving them to their own devices to accomplish it. And then we can see how easy they found it and did they take that route that you were expecting and where were the stress points and how can they be fixed. Uh, number eight is competitors. So understanding your site and your own UX is really important but they absolutely shouldn't be in isolation and you should be learning from what your competitors are doing and also from what mistakes they are making. So you can be listening to what your customers say about your competitor website and essentially doing it better. And a thorough UX program of research will not only focus on your site, but basically those of your top competitors as well to really give you the edge. There we go. All the retailers there. Uh, number nine, <clears throat> um, this is a slightly different one actually, uh, so understand the entire digital journey. So UX is usually focused, as I've said, about improving your own site and making your site as good as it can be. But we think it's really important to understand what people are doing and how they're behaving when they're also not on your site. Um, and this is particularly important if your customers tend to browse, research, uh, or maybe take their time over a, over a certain purchase. Um, we actually have a tool that we have developed here called Reflected Life. Some of you may have come across it, which is our digital tracking panel. And it can be used to monitor digital behavior passively. So how does that work? Um, I mean, basically, we have recruited over 2,000 people, and they have installed an app on their various devices. This collects data for all of the web browsing that they do. Um, and the real beauty in terms of insight is that it is also um, a survey platform. So when there's anything that we don't understand about a behavior or we want to probe further on, um, then we can. Passive measurement, or it, it's basically about using passive metering to collect data in the background of, of the devices that they're using. And you can track activities for all brands um, including yours and your competitors and we can show you how your web experience sits within the context of an entire user journey so not just when they're on your site. Some of the key things that we can track um, websites and web pages visited, apps downloaded and used, text messages although not the messages themselves but whether they're opening whether they're using the program, um, location if GPS is on, connection type and any other device specific metrics such as I don't know battery levels or signal strengths. Um, but this isn't a static situation and actually with the market continually evolving and technology moving on we are adapting to any metric that we collect and the way we collect them. Uh, I'll show you an example of some output so we can do some really insightful stuff around journey mapping. So this shows the typical day in the life for a particular segment of smartphone user, mapping out how they use their device um, through the day and the sites and the apps that they're using and uh, where they are when they're doing so. This is extremely powerful 
for bringing the data to life and telling stories about a particular, um, a particular user or, or a, a common journey that people take. And this can also be something that works really well in video format, which is something that we're doing now for some of our clients. Uh, for example, we worked recently with Tesco Bank um, to understand the customer loan journey. Uh, so we've all probably taken out various loans and insurances, um, and it can be quite a long and considered process. So through passive measurement, we were able to tell Tesco Bank which websites, apps, and search terms were used by consumers to identify what product they were after, which was then overlain with um, qualitative interviews, both before and after the purchase, um, to build a really full understanding of consumer behavior and what role Tesco Bank's own website um, played with that. Equally, uh, we're now working on um, a big project with a drinks manufacturer um, to understand how customers shop for their product on different online grocery platforms, and therefore to work out where the opportunities lie for that particular manufacturer. So we're currently looking at how our um, reflected life panelists are actually using different online grocery services, such as Tesco, Sainsbury's, and Waitrose, and others, um, and what brands these customers are putting in, into their basket. And it's a fairly complex system of coding and data analysis, but it's serving up a really powerful view of their brand online across multiple platforms. In many respects, actually, this service, the uh, passive metering, it is not about pure usability testing, but it's building up a really comprehensive picture of how your customers are using your website um, and your competitors. And the final one, number 10, if you're keeping up, uh, it's all about being really clever with your UX. So if you are satisfied that the navigation issues and the website experience are as good as you think it can be, um, then you need to be taking your UX testing to the next level. So by testing your website using the power of consumer neuroscience, um, which is something we're really working hard on at the moment, you'll be able to understand levels of emotional engagement and withdrawal as users navigate through your site. So consumer neuroscience is a technique that is used typically for advertising, um, but some brands are leading the way in UX innovation by working to use thinking from neuroscience um, in their development, which is really, really exciting. So this has already been used by leading brands to, um, to optimize their web experience to put them ahead of their competitors. Let's just go back a step in case people aren't familiar with how neuro works. Um, here's a quick rundown. So we can monitor the relevance by EEG um, of what people are looking at. We can use galvanic skin response, um, which essentially looks at short-term excitement when they're looking at a website. And furthermore, we can do reaction time testing within a survey about your website, um, which uncovers rational and emotional associations with your brand. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, here's a picture of a neuro test in action. So uh, we worked with Tesco.com to understand how people feel as they navigate their way around the Tesco.com website. Now, this was really groundbreaking uh, research for us um, and for Tesco. Um, what we were able to do is look at how the user browses the website and then is exposed to different things on the site. And the EEG and the GSR is constantly tracked during that website visit. So this is then amalgamated up over several users, usually more than 40, and it's looked at as a whole. Not only that, though, we did the same for competitors, and uh, we were able to see how different sites were used, and critically, where Neuro really comes uh, to, to fruition is how people were feeling throughout that user experience, which gives our clients a really good understanding of where the gaps are in their experience um, versus competitors. <coughs> Right, so that was a really quick rundown. I didn't want to go into any in too much detail, but I think it's uh, hopefully been useful to go through 10 different approaches to UX testing. Um, and I ho I hopefully you're already doing some of these. Um, if you've got a big web design or web launch come, uh, coming up soon, um, then you know hopefully you'll be doing all, if not some, of these. Um, and hopefully there was a few elements within that that can provide you with some food for thought. Um, if you, of course, uh, sales plug here, but if you want to know any more about any of the ideas um, that I've presented in this webinar, then please do get in touch. And then I think I'm going to hand over to Becky, and we're going to see if we've got any live user questions, because I did forget to say at the beginning, 
um, please feel free to ask any questions via the chat box. Um, but we're going to have a look now. So if you've got any questions, type quickly and uh, we shall try to answer them. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Amy. <coughs> um, that was really interesting. I'm just going to look here if we have... <coughs> Excuse um, me. So just whilst we're waiting, um, if there are any questions, I was wondering myself, so you mentioned at the start there about um, <coughs> web design <coughs> constantly changing um, and, it's, and keeping up. So quite often, I imagine, sort of, there's sort of constant changes happening to websites and things like that. Kind of at what point <coughs> do you have an idea of... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, do you have any thoughts on kind of what sort type of changes or at what point should you kind of use mm. sort of usability testing? Okay. I think it's a really good um, question, but it's always a question of budget versus um, what you need to know. So I would say, use, you know, proper usability using consumer insight, it's probably worth saving that for the big changes, um, just being realistic um, on uh, where your insight budget will lie. Um, so, I mean, I would say use, do UX testing on every change, but that's just not realistic. And I think it's best to save it for when you think there's something that's actually affected the user experience or potentially has an impact on sales or um, the number of people going to be clicking on your key um, call to action button. Okay, yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question here from Sandra. Um, so hello, hello to you too. Um, what is the platform you use for the heat maps and for tracking the browsing patterns? Oh, um, that's a technical question, Sandra. Um, I will have to get back to you on that one, if that's okay, because we have our own eye tracking um, equipment here um, at the office, so I have to go and ask the eye tracking experts if that's okay. <laughs> Great, yeah, so we'll get back to you on that one, Sandra. Um, so let me just check. Okay, so we've just got... <coughs> <coughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I've got one more here um, from Philip. Uh, so another good question. Thank you, Philip. Um, so if you're doing like a, a big overhaul of website, mm. what is sometimes the trade-off for existing customers versus using it to get new customers or reach out to new customers? So, okay. So if you're doing a big overhaul on your website, um, this is kind of going back to what I said earlier, if you think there's going to be something that changes the flow through your website or um, it's a very big design change or even a big change on how you present yourself externally that internally people might, uh, might struggle to deal with, um, I think it's always important to trial it first. So that's where I talk about beta testing. So always, um, you know, but run some UX on your beta site and get people to give feedback and get, watch people to um, uh, watch people how they're using the site um, and I think also when you're doing that it's really important to test it with new and also with existing customers um, and uh, and different segments of your customer base as well so depending on what you need to know um, I think it's always worth trialing any big site design before it goes live. Brilliant, thank you very much Amy. Um, Thank you so much, um, Sandra Phillip, for your questions. Um, if anyone else has any questions um, and you want to get in touch with us separately uh, to the webinar, please do uh, feel free to do so. Um, we will be sending around um, a follow-up email, which will include a link to a recording um, if you'd like to listen again or if you wish to share this with any of your colleagues. Um, but thank you very much uh, for joining us, and I hope you have a great <laughs> rest of the afternoon. <laughs>